I have no idea where the class of 2004 is sitting. So, <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Hawks, Senior Associate Dean for External Engagement. Thank you so much for joining us for Reunion. Our team has been working for a year or two with many of you as Reunion volunteers, but we are so happy you're here celebrating with us. So I will kick things off before our uh, interim dean, Georgia Parakis, will host our fireside chat. And I will briefly introduce Georgia to all of you. She uh, joined the dean's office on very short notice in February, and we are thrilled that she's here. She sits in the John C. Head III deanship and also is a professor of operations management, operation, operations research, and statistics. Her research and teaching fo focus on analytics and AI at the intersection of optimization and machine learning with applications in pricing, revenue management, supply chain, and healthcare, and way beyond. So I am thrilled that she is here today join, um, hosting our fireside chat. And over to you, Georgia. Boy. Thank you so much, Kathy. This is my first reunion <laughs> as uh, the John C. Head Dean, and it's kind of quite a privilege uh, to be here and to be doing this with Thank Marcus. Uh, and I'm especially glad to see so many of you uh, at, on campus. I went to some of the reunions yesterday. Uh, we've had many graduations for so our different programs. And today, and it's really giving me a lot of energy despite my allergies. Sitting out in Killian Court for two days, this is the outcome, basically. But what Kathy and her team let me know, and I'm amazed, is that we have 1,600 alumni and guests on campus. Wow, thank you for coming back. And they span, you all span, I should say, 50 countries. So thank you for coming to Cambridge, to MIT, and keep coming, and my office is open to any of you that uh, wants to come and see us. But enough about uh, me and this, and let's get to really our guest of honor here, which is really a privilege to introduce Marcus Wilson, who is with us today, yeah. and who is uh, class of 2004. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, because it's unbelievable that he's celebrating his 20th reunion. Wow. Yeah. And my understanding is there's a big fan club <laughs> in the audience <laughs> who are going to heckle him throughout. Yes, yes, this will certainly be the most raucous fireside. <laughs> yes, including, if I may embarrass her, his wife, Anisha. Sorry. <laughs> It takes two people to be successful. It never takes one, in my opinion. <laughs> but to be serious, Marcus is the co-founder of Noble, which is an athletic footwear and apparel training brand that he launched with his partner in 2015. And in addition to Noble, he's really a seasoned entrepreneur, marketer, storyteller that has spent more than 20 years in the business, finding ways for big brands and startups to grow and be successful. Before Noble, he was uh, the head of brand strategy at Reebok, an venture in investor and operator. He holds his undergraduate from Cornell University and an MBA from MIT Sloan from 2004, as we said. And he's been wonderful to the school, serving as a professional advisor to current students, to alumni, and so much more that I know he wants to get involved. So we really are thrilled to have Marcus here. And I should say that as I was looking into Marcus and you know, hearing his podcast and so forth, and I went to my trainer and I s said, Dave, I met the co-founder of Noble. Have you heard of Noble? He looks at me and he says, are you kidding? What do you think I'm wearing? <laughs> I have many pairs. I'm like, all right, all right. <laughs> But on a serious note, please welcome, uh, let's welcome Marcus and thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And now, you know, this is not a fireside shot, it's actually a roast. <laughs> 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 and we have two rows of people. There we go, there we least. go. A few of them will not touch microphones. <laughs> But let's start a little bit of conversations today. And can you share with us a little bit about how you transition from your time at Sloan 
to the early days of your career in athletic wear. Yes, Tell us a little bit. For sure. But thank you for uh, inviting me to do this. It's been a fun process and getting to know you and everybody else who's make, uh, made this happen. So I really am excited to be here. Um, so for me, uh, with MIT Sloan and many of the people here, uh, after Sloan, I went to Reebok. Um, and when I was at Reebok, I was the head of brand strategy and started to get into the industry. Uh, and from Reebok, I left uh, and entered the venture capital world and realized uh, pretty quickly when I stepped into a portfolio company that I liked the operating side of startups better than the investing side. And I just didn't have that particular idea of what I wanted to start. Uh, but at Reebok, I met my uh, co-founder at Noble. Uh, he was the creative director um, for Reebok, so responsible for footwear and apparel design globally. And we became really good friends when we were working at Reebok. And then we would start to get together uh, after I left periodically to talk what it would be about what it would be like to start our own thing. And uh, it turned into like a monthly breakfast. And then it started to feel like it, we were at a point where it was just going to be two guys talking about doing things and never actually doing it. Uh, and then after one of the breakfasts, I said, uh, you know what, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to spend my whole day working on a business plan. And before I go to bed, I'm going to send you something. And uh, sent him something, at a business plan, which I have to go back and find, because I, I, every time I tell this story, uh, I would love to see that plan. <laughs> sent him the plan at like 11.30, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, he calls back and says, all right, we've got to, we've got to try it. And uh, that was 2012, and then Noble came online in 2015. Wow, impressive. And still going very, very strong. Yeah. <laughs> so I love really one of the quotes in your company that says, it's for people who train hard and don't believe in excuses. I love it. Uh, and this actually holds for everything in life, actually, yeah. I would say, and not just for Noble. But from our conversations when we met, I understand that the way you got into CrossFit and all of that was because of your early stages in your career and how this pushed your body in the limit a little bit. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about this experience and any advice for people to avoid? Uh, <laughs> yes, sure. We can have you say it or Anisha can say the story. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, yes, Anisha could teach a class on things to avoid with all of this. Um, but for me, it's a, the brand for, does, uh, does, how many people know about Noble, by the way? I'm guessing my classmates do. But So for those of you who don't know, I hope my classmates do. For the, those of you who don't know, uh, Noble is an athletic footwear and apparel brand. Uh, we launched in 2015, and the brand kind of mentality or, or ethos is about uh, it's something that came from insight that Michael, my business partner, and I had when we were at Reebok. And it wasn't just about Reebok, but it was about the industry. And we were just tired of hearing brands you know, say, wear our products and you'll be able to run faster or jump higher. And we just thought that that was bullshit. And that's actually where the name came from, Noble. Is it, um, and so for us, it was about if you want to be better at anything, if you want to be able to run faster or jump higher, you want to be a better professor or firefighter, whatever it is, you need to stop making excuses and you need to put in the work. And it's really up to you. And when we did that, we feel like we tapped into kind of a mindset. And we launched initially within the CrossFit market, um, but it is expanded beyond that. And so it really kind of struck, you know, kind of touched a nerve with people around wanting to improve and getting better. And so that's kind of where the, the, the brand name came from and the mentality that is behind it. Great. And I understand that there is a story behind how you got to cross. So specifically, uh, so when I made that transition from Reebok into uh, a startup, I just drastically underestimated um, the amount of work and everything with it. And so I stopped working out, and I've been a lifelong athlete, you know, not eating right, all of the just bad, bad habits. And one morning, I went to put on my sock, and I like pulled something in my back. And I was just devastated. I literally just sat on the bed for like 30 minutes just staring at the carpet like, what has happened to me? What has become of my life? I called in the office and I said, I'm not coming in today. I'm going to a gym. And they're like, are you all right? I'm like, no, I am not all right. And I went, so I went to a CrossFit gym um, and said, sign me up. Tell me what to do. And uh, then just went down the rabbit hole of CrossFit and uh, really, really got into it. Um, and Anisha at some point was like, can you slow down just a little bit? Um, and just really, really enjoyed it. And so that's kind of once I was doing that, I started talking with my business partner, and he was doing the same thing. And so we were like, let's start a brand and launch it in the CrossFit space. That's a great story. <laughs> All right, if you can go actually back to your younger self before uh, launching Nobel. What advice would you give yourself and what would you do differently, actually? 
Well, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, so one of the things, certainly as it relates to being an entrepreneur, um, communicating with one's spouse or partner is critically important, and I did not do a great job of that. Um, so communication, really thinking things through. Um, there's a part of, uh, there's an important part of being kind of optimistic, um, which is uh, critical because entrepreneurship is hard and there are gonna be a lot of hard times, so you have to believe you can get through those. Um, but really uh, believing in what you're doing and setting a, a course and a path that you feel proud of. And that's one of the things that Michael and I did when we were creating products. We used kind of, are we proud of this as a guide to if we wanted to put it into the world. And early on, there were a few products that we weren't proud of that we did not launch. Uh, and those were really, you know, when I look back on them, very, very good decisions. Um, but once we put something out that we were proud of, uh, it just kind of started to take off. Very interesting. Okay. So I understand there are a few of your classmates in the audience. Can you raise a, your hand? if you were his classmate. Okay, wow, <laughs> very nice. Uh, and of course, if you and MIT alumni that are also you know, your friends and your uh, fans, I would say. So tell us a little bit about a moment in time outside Nobel, not related to Nobel, that you were pushed out of your comfort zone and how you dealt with it. Outside of Noble, can it be kind of loosely connected? Because there's a fun story. There's a fun story outside of my comfort zone uh, that involves Scott Bush, um, which was kind of fun. And so this was a year, about a year and a half ago, and uh, I played in this golf tournament, the Waste Management Pro Am, and um, I had pushed to get into this tournament because I like to play golf. I am not a golfer, just to be clear, but I am, you know, optimistic and figured it would be a lot of fun. And when I asked to do it, I was, we had a partnership with the PGA, I asked them uh, to play. But I asked them months in advance, because I figured they would either say yes or no, and if the answer was yes, I could practice. And a week before the tournament, I, uh, I get a call saying, hey, are you really serious about this? And I was like, yeah, sure. And um, Scott Bush said he was gonna caddy for me, and that's a whole other story. Um, but I'm there at this tournament, and Scott, waiting on Scott to kind of show up, because I have his credentials, and um, I'm on the driving range between Hideki Matsui and, and Reggie Bush, and uh, up walks Scott Bush, who somehow found his way onto the, onto the driving range. And I went to, uh, there were security following him, which had me a little bit concerned. I went over to give the, the security badge, and Scott Bush, the per people walk up to him, and they're like, are you Scott Bush from Templeton Rye? So these are people who were fans of the business that Scott started, <laughs> wanted to take photos with him, and then afterwards, it was like, Scott says to me, people who have recognized Scott Bush, Two people who've recognized Marcus Wilson, zero. <laughs> so so that's, uh, that was uh, playing in that tournament. It got me outside of my comfort zone, but I had a close friend there who was kind of cheering me on. And when I was on the very first tee, uh, it was Jordan Spieth was, I was playing with. He tees off first, and of course, it's right down the middle of the fairway. And I step, and then it's me. So after they introduced Jordan Spieth, they now introduce Marcus Wilson, co-founder of Noble. And I had not been playing golf, and I put my, <laughs> I tee it up, and I look up, and I realize in that moment, this is how I did not think it through, there are fans lining the fairway <laughs> for a, like a 150 yard sound. And I literally am like, I could kill somebody right now with this tee shot. <laughs> and so the whole time I'm like, just please get it in the air. And yeah, so it was, uh, I didn't kill anyone, uh, so it was a lot of fun, but I was way, way outside my comfort zone. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, you know, when you are in this type of business and we're talking about Noble, you really need to connect with consumers. So tell us what's your strategy about that. Well, for us in the early days, when it came to connecting with the consumers, Michael and I were consumers. The people on our team were consumers. We were avid CrossFitters. We really believed in the brand. The brand was actually a part of who we were. So we were creating products, again, that we were proud of. We were creating messaging that really connected with us and is something that we were putting out into the world. And it was also, in 2015, it was kind of like the heyday of social media and all of these things. And with CrossFit in its infancy, you know, CrossFit, there, was, there weren't really professional athletes in CrossFit. The sport was being professionalized. So there was, you know, within the, we didn't do a lot of analysis around the CrossFit market, but it was a, you know, a, a just a very passionate consumer base, very price insensitive, um, and love new things. And also, 
as a new brand, it was kind of a David versus Goliath type thing. So the community really leaned in, the athletes that we had relationships with uh, leaned in, and there's a really powerful word of mouth effect around it. And as you're connecting with your customers, have you ever traveled or had the story <laughs> that you have uh, yeah, customers so a, connect with you? Yeah, one of the fun <laughs> things about it is that especially in the early days of Noble, within the CrossFit community, Noble was very well known. And outside of it, you know, people hadn't really heard much about it. Um, but within the community, very passionate. So there are all these times that will come up where uh, uh, someone would realize that I'm the uh, co-founder of Noble and it would kind of change the whole dynamic. And once, one of the stories I told Georgia was uh, when I was at, going through TSA. And my bag got flagged, and they were starting to take everything out. And he's like, oh, cool bag. And then he sees my cards. He's like, why is all this noble stuff? And I was like, oh, I'm one of the founders. And then sat up, and he's like, oh, my, and put everything back in my bag. <laughs> it's like, you know, go on your way. And I was like, you, please do your job, you know. And he was like, no, thank you. It was great to meet you. So that was a really fun story. So... Yes. Well, that was a great story. I wanted him to share it with all of you, not just with me. <laughs> so I'm sure that you are currently facing, like every company, a lot of challenges. Tell me one big challenge you have and how you are dealing with it. Well, uh, scaling, right? So it's one of the things within, there are phases to starting a business. There are, you know, getting a business from zero to 10 million uh, is one thing. It's a different set of challenges scaling from 10 million to 100 million. And as you go beyond and you enter different phases, you it requires different skill sets, different team members, all of those things. And so the challenge that we've had, one of the biggest challenges is that we grew so fast. Um, it's kind of careful what you wish for. Really being able to get kind of systems, processes, and people uh, in place. So not only when you're, when you're starting a business, you know, in our early days, it was a lot of the team members, it was their first or second job. Um, but as we were growing, it was every month was like a new record uh, for most of the team. And so when you start to bring in people with expertise of where you're going, then there's like the cultural dynamics of old guard and new guard. And, you know, the old guard is actually young and the new guard is actually, you know, uh, older and more experienced. And those have been some of the biggest challenges that we've, that we've had in being able to get those, uh, to be able to keep up with that. And, uh, and then recognizing that you can't always um, and you've got to figure stuff out along the way. And as you're dealing with challenges like this, and I'm sure many others over the different stages of your careers, what are some things that the Sloan School taught you and that has stayed with you and helped you and maybe still hopefully helps you to get through them and be the leader that you are? Well, one, you know, a lot of those reasons are here on the front row, right? It's, it's the, the alumni network, your friends, your classmates, being able to talk to people who have gone through similar things. And actually, this, uh, uh, just since I've been here, there was a student panel that I went to yesterday and hearing from classmates who are you know, actively starting a business now, classmates who have recently exited businesses and kind of everything in between, and then also what people are dealing with in life. You know, it's at, we're at a stage, you know, for at a 20 year reunion, we've all had to deal with a lot of personal things, personal loss. There's classmates of ours who have passed away um, and people who've had family struggles and all that. Like at our you know, five year reunion, there was a lot of stuff that we hadn't even encountered yet. Um, and I'm sure people who are here for their 25th and 30 re year reunion are like, you haven't seen anything yet. Um, <laughs> so it's like really uh, um, recognizing um, just Life as a part of all this is something that's very important and I've really started to appreciate even more just uh, with all of these things. But having a network of people that you can lean on and talk to is critically important and being willing to talk to people. Um, and then obviously uh, family and friends and significant others. You know, I think I'm asking too many questions just myself and I think I want to ask the audience to what questions do you have for Marcus? And if you don't ask, I'm going to call call on people. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> One of my former students here. <laughs> oh, hey, Ben. Thank you. Congratulations. Especially. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Ben. I'm a fan of the brand. I think the floral at the bottom was a cool thing to see, and you've developed the line. You know, I've got a question. Like, I, I started a consumer brand a few years ago. That's just hit 10 of sales and now I'm at that point where I'm exactly thinking, oh, I've got to bring the different people in. 
like, who did you bring in? Like, how did, like, who were the key hires at 10 that helped you get to that 100? And, like, how did they help you think about the business differently and, and kind of stuff like that? And I'd love some advice around that. Yeah, so for me, one of the things is it's, when I reflect on it, it was more about the size of the team and not necessarily the size of the business. And so because when you're at a, 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 a how many employees do you have now? Yeah, so you, so you know them all, you know them well, you work with them, they know like you're completely on top of the business. And so hiring is really, really important. And so finding someone to help you with that, that can really be good because around 50 to 70 or so is where I started to be a little bit more removed. And the dynamics start to change because you don't get to work with everybody. You start to like, you have to trust people more. And then also, especially as a founder, it was weird for me, but then people start to get you know, uncomfortable around you, intimidated by you, and not wanting to um, uh, bring up problems because they want to solve them before they come to you with it. And so one, creating a culture where people are comfortable bringing those things forward um, is critically important. You know, I did that well for a while, but it got really, really hard uh, later on. Um, even like one of the things when we were about uh, 50 or 60 people, it got to a point where I realized I didn't know people as well. So I had someone set up walking meetings, a 15 minute walking meeting kind of every day. And I said, start with the most recent hire and go all the way down to employee number one and come all the way back up. And the next day, the person's like, not going to lie, everybody's shook by why you want to meet with them. And I was like, well, this is the exact point. So really focusing on kind of uh, the hires. The challenge is at, at, at that size is it's still a big risk for people to come join a, uh, a company at that size. And trying to find the balance there is really, really hard. But having someone who can help you with those hires um, is important, or even maybe a group of people. Yeah. Or here. I guess you want as many customers as possible. And uh, we know that 80% of people, on average, don't exercise. <laughs> so have you thought on how to effectively change the lifestyle of people to exercise more or to exercise and to make that a habit, a daily habit like eating or bathing? Yeah, uh, uh, that is a great, great question. And so the number in, so it changes over time for us, you know, within the company. So in the early days, you know, the market is bi like big enough for us. It's finding the people. So when we say we're a brand for people who work hard and don't believe in excuses, we also recognize that we're not for everybody. Um, but if you want to put in the work and you recognize that's the way to get better, then Noble is for you, might be for you. And so we invite people in and um, highlight people who have worked hard, highlight people who are seeing success. So it's not just about, like, one of the things about CrossFit in the early, early days, people were intimidated by it. And, but it's a very inviting community once you're in it. And so for us, it was celebrating someone who was 400 pounds, but they you know, had been working out and they're now down to 280 pounds. I mean, it's one of these things that it doesn't, like when it, we focus on the work and celebrate the work, not on exactly where people are. And so it, by doing that and telling that story, um, we found that people who are ready to be a part of it, um, have been joining. It will change, though, as we get bigger and as we scale more. It becomes a lot more challenging. Um, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, quick question for you. When you first started your business, were there any preconceived notions or assumptions that you made about your business or your consumers? Um, and those assumptions have changed or you kind of validate those are false along the way. And um, did you make any kind of key pivots in your business along your journey? So as far as like the way that we launched, we knew the, the consumers really, really well. There wasn't a lot of research. There wasn't a, you know, a lot of work that we put into it. Um, and going, again, when you have zero dollars in revenue, um, it's a new brand for a lot of people. So there weren't a lot of assumptions that we made that were, were off. There were risks that we took. So the, the point about uh, the shoes with flowers on them. So we're a brand for people who work hard and CrossFit, and it's like pretty, a pretty um, intense sport. 
But one of the things that we did early on, we had this uh, athlete um, uh, who was built like a Viking. I mean, he was like a G.I. Joe action figure. He had a, a, a beard, braids, and was just jacked. And we created this concept um, called uh, of a floral shop where we created this fictitious thing where we, it's like he was a florist. And we launched these shoes with flowers on it. And to this day, people think he's a florist. Like people in the CrossFit community <laughs> think this guy's a florist. And this was like in 2016 or 2017. Um, and we were just taking a risk and trying something and we didn't know if it was gonna work. And uh, when we put it out there, the shoes just you know, evaporated. I mean, they just sold so quickly. And then we started to lean into it. We took risk, other risks where we tried to create a coffee shop for one of our other athletes and no one was really into it. So it's like <laughs> you take a risk and you lean into the ones that work. What did you do between 2012 and 2015? Like, oh, so yeah. Was that all incubation or? <laughs> no, so, um, the good question. Uh, so so um, my business partner had a non-compete with Reebok. And so we decided that we wanted to launch our own thing. But because he had a non-compete, like most entrepreneurs, we were super you know, confident and, and thought we would have with our backgrounds and athletic footwear and apparel brand up and running in no time. And so we better start somewhere else. Um, the beauty of doing that um, uh, is that we got a lot of experience that we needed and we didn't really know that we needed. And so my business partner um, is a cold, was a cold water surfer, and, which I'd never heard of. So like the waves in New England are better in the winter. So there's a group of people that put on wetsuits and go surfing like walk through the snow to surf, um, which is just to me is absolutely insane. Um, but it also speaks to how much confidence and belief I had in my partner. I was like, oh, let's start a company there. Um, and we literally, it was just the two of us. And whenever he, our, our first website, he designed it in Illustrator, sent me each page. I got like a Wix account, I, I kid you not, dropped it in the background and built this website over it. And when I didn't know how to get it something exactly right, I was Googling you know, how to code. And um, it sounds outlandish now, but what it, we had to figure stuff out. And we learned along the way. And then whenever we put anything from that brand out into the world, people in our network who were at startups were like, love your website. We need a new website. Who designed it? And we said, well, we did. And they said, would you design one for us? <coughs> and so organically, an agency, we built an agency out of that that then ended up allowing us to kind of bootstrap the business. And that's what we did until... 2015, and so there's a period in 2015 where we had an agency, you know, a cold water surfing brand, which is, uh, you know, uh, crazy, um, and Noble. And, uh, and then Black Friday of 2015, you know, uh, it was like that scene from Jaws, where it's like, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Um, <laughs> and it was like this thing, it, like we launched at midnight, so, you know, 11.45 p.m., thousands of people on the website. We don't have nearly enough inventory for any of that. Everything sold out in, uh, you know, in minutes. And then the next Monday, we were calling all the clients with the agencies saying that we're, we're shutting it down. So <laughs> that was fun. Well, well. So I'm, I'm curious how you uh, get to the point where you launch your website before midnight and then you got a thousand uh, users already. Yeah, so um, one, as it related to like product launching, um, one of the things when we very, well, the very first time we launched, we didn't have, like we were launching a bit of a pre-sale. And so uh, anybody in manufacturing familiar with Chinese New Year, our first production run was supposed to be done pre-Chinese New Year but the factory wasn't giving us a date. And so we started to tease a product launch before we had product um, because we needed something to talk about. And so one of the very first photos we, we pushed out in social media was a shoebox with blue laces coming out. And people are like, ooh, what's in there? What's in there? And the answer was nothing. Like, we didn't even have any shoes. It was literally laces. And then my business partner was like, hey, here's something. And, um, and so we kind of stumbled into this, like, excitement and, and teasing around product launches. And so with, um, by the time Black Friday had come around, we had been building, kind of starting to build uh, a following through social media and, and some athletes. So we would get into a process a couple of weeks before a product launch where we would tease things along the way um, instead of just saying, hey, here's a shoe, do you wanna buy one? We tried to create emotions connected to it. 
Um, you know, I, I'd love to hear a bit more about the CrossFit relationship because um, from the outside, um, early on, I'm like, okay, Reebok owns CrossFit. You know what I mean? Like in terms of the yeah. public perception. And then the last couple of years, it's like, oh, Noble does now. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In terms of looking at it. So what was that like? I understand there were legacy Reebok relationships, but what was the politics with Reebok like around that? And then like, um, how did you strike this deal to really become the face of CrossFit, which is very different than where you started with CrossFit? Yeah, so when we launched, we launched within the CrossFit space. And so we were able to go to kind of regional events, which are very relevant within CrossFit the very first year. Um, and then we got banned from them because Reebok was a title sponsor. It was the Reebok CrossFit Games. Um, and so we were very kind of grassroots within, within the CrossFit community. But then um, CrossFit had kind of all sorts of challenges and turmoil at the end of their, at their partnership. And I had become friends uh, with the, the investor who stepped in and bought CrossFit. And he was a noble customer and a noble fan. And I had met him before any of that happened. He literally just you know, came to the office because he was just like a fan of noble. And then when he owned CrossFit, then he reached out saying, hey, would you like to do something? And so then it was like kind of right time, right moment. Um, so then we started talking with him. And then it became, uh, we did a three year deal, which ended last January, where it was the noble CrossFit Games. Hello, um, thank you so much. I'm really curious to know, um, clearly you have a very strong affinity to CrossFit and that was a natural fit. So CrossFit kind of going through its trend cycles with popularity and all that stuff, kind of how do you guys deal with that? And then knowing that you guys have gone into to the golf space and that's maybe less of the affinity based on your story at least, um, curious to know how you guys decided to expand into uh, like following verticals beyond CrossFit and how you kind of looked at that. Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting. So I'm both my partner and I were really into CrossFit, but we're ultimately just athletes and like to work out and like to train. That's what we like to do on vacation. When Anish and I travel, we work out every single day. It's just a part of who we are, and that evolves. So when it comes to CrossFit, I don't I I don't do CrossFit that much anymore, um, but I do a lot of other things. And so what we've seen is that. CrossFitters who were knew about the brand and and moved on from CrossFit and they would go to Lifetime or Equinox or wherever they would they would literally take Noble with them. Um, there were strength and conditioning coaches in the NBA and NFL who were introducing the brand to professional athletes um, because they were wearing it. And so there's this really cool, especially in the early days, organic. Um, spread around it. And one interesting thing about us being a training brand that I think is going to be beneficial for us longer term because we are seen as a training brand. And so we have athletes in every sport in the world training in Noble and then asking us for sports specific products. So golf is a perfect example. Scott Stallings is one of our now one of our um, sponsored <coughs> athletes. He was a, uh, a CrossFitter early on and use CrossFit and high intensity interval training um, as his kind of training protocol. So he knew Noble and he came to the office one day. I didn't know who Scott was. Um, I wasn't at all thinking about golf. And uh, he just showed up in the, the office one day to meet some people. And he was like, golfers are getting fitter. Like Noble needs to come into golf. And he basically just kind of pulled us into, uh, into golf. And so we've just been following kind of where our kind of rabid customer base has been spent, uh, uh, spreading to. Hi, uh, Alex Borshoot, MBA 2014. Um, I saw on your website, it was interesting, there was a, a, a tab for the TB12 nutrition. And I was curious about, you talked about expanding into other sports, but also uh, that, is there a partnership there with nutrition, expanding into nutrition as a, as a way to expand the, the Noble brand platform? Um, how do you think about that and, and growing that company? Yeah, so, um, so TB12 now is a part of Noble. Um, so Tom Brady's a, a partner in the business, and um, our last investment round was with Mike Rapoli, who was a, a co-founder of Vitamin Water, Smart Water, uh, Water, which he sold to Coke for four billion, and then Body Armor, uh, which he sold to Coke for eight billion. And so uh, when he invested, he had uh, was also uh, owned TB12 with Tom, and so has brought Tom into all those things. But going back to being a training brand, it is like what is relevant for the training consumer. And uh, nutrition is absolutely uh, important to, to that. And so for us, 
if consumers view us as a, a training brand, we think that nutrition can be an opportunity. But if we're seen as a footwear brand, like that's not going to work out well. So we're betting on the mindset, the mentality, uh, that nutrition can become a, a, a pillar of Noble over time. Great that you picked up on that, though, because it's not a, uh, we haven't really formally announced all of that yet. <laughs> well, no. There we go. <laughs> What's up, Marcus? Thank you for coming. I uh, want to say I'm a big fan of the real stuff, so <laughs> great whiskey if you're a drinker, please, like whiskey rum. This guy knows his stuff, Scott Bush. Um, but I'm just curious. I know that you guys leverage a lot of influencers within the CrossFit space initially. Um, just curious, how do you think about creators and influencers and balancing the importance of working directly with those folks versus like focusing on your own brand marketing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, because in the early days for us, it was, we were focused really on kind of the, the more hardcore athletes and we weren't leaning into influencers. Um, and we're recognizing that there is an opportunity there, but we have to do it in an authentic way. So I think there's this like this, you know, influencer um, kind of, mentality that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're really working out, they're just like putting out stuff on Instagram and look at me, look at me, look at me. Um, but there are people um, who do work hard and they do have large followings. And um, so it's like really starting to kind of think through um, how to do that in, an, in a real authentic way. Um, and we haven't figured it out, but we're trying some things and learning and going. Marcus, how are you doing, sir? All right, Chike, how are you? So, so, so two questions, but the first one is really, really the most important question. We'd like to know which of your classmates in the room, and you have to pick one, is the most inspirational on your journey. So I have a great answer for this. I have a great answer for this, and this is like a political answer, so I'm gonna answer a different question. And I'll tell you the, the classmate in the room who, and I'll tell you the specific incident, instance because it also connected to another alum. The classmate in the room who had my back the most at one moment in time, and that's Chris Bell. And this is, we were at, what was the, it was a, the end of the year event where it was, this was, we, we were, it was 04s and 03s and there was, may or may not have been alcohol involved and may or not, may not have had a lot of trash talking going on. And by the end of the night, there was a bet that was about a one-on-one -on -one basketball match between me and uh, an 03. And I was astounded that no one thought it could win. And the only person who had my back was Chris. Now, now because of the alcohol I was gonna beat, I said I could win you know, 11 to zero. And, um, <laughs> and Everybody, and it escalated because this guy was like, you gotta be kidding me, and then I was like, you gotta be kidding me, and then the next day they were calling saying, hey, you can back out of the bed, and I'm like, I'm not backing out of anything. <laughs> and it escalated to a very end of the year event where this basketball match was gonna happen, and the only person who had my back the entire time was Chris Bell, so. <laughs> Uh, and Chris no. and I won some money that day too. Just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so okay. So now, so now, a more serious question: When you, when you, kind of, be optimistic and you know push yourself to the the big hairy audacious goal, right? And what's possible? What? Tell us a little bit about what you what you think about and where you want to take Noble over time. So in, that's evolved over time around that, because when, when, at least for me, when you start something, you, it, it not really knowing where it's gonna go, not really knowing kind of the, the when and how momentum, or if momentum will come. Um, so it's something that's kind of a, a thing to kind of reflect on, you know, every six months or, you know, every few years around it, and, my, and the answer to that has kind of changed along the way. So where I am now, the stage of life, you know, that Anisha and I are in, it's like, you know, how do we expand this you know, to a place of success? And then how do we kind of live after that, right? So it's now um, 52, 
And it's like, okay, how do we, in our, our daughters, we have a 15 year old and a 19 year old, our 19 year old's in college. The 15 year old is a freshman, finishing her freshman year next week of high school. Um, and when she graduates, we are empty nesters and we are not like tied to any one place. So starting to think about all those things differently around life after Noble. I think we have time for one more question. How are we doing with time? Okay. Hi, Marcus. Um, I had a question about the early days of Noble. Um, like you said, you didn't have a product yet, and perhaps social media was not such a big thing when you launched. So how did you build that initial buzz around the brand? And then, you know, after that Black Friday moment, how did you keep that momentum going? So for us, a lot of the things we kind of stumbled into, right? So it was like we had to create content even when we didn't have product to kind of get things going. Um, we bought for our first production run, we, we made as many shoes as we could afford to buy. Um, and then uh, the manufacturer ended up delaying the first product run. So it was supposed to be a two week uh, pre-sale and 15 minutes before that very initial launch, uh, they said that the product they're gonna make pre-Chinese New Year, they're just gonna make after Chinese New Year, which it suddenly went to like a three to four month uh, pre-sale. But we had put so much work into it. We, we did feel proud of the product that we were making. And at that point it was like, you know, screw it, let's just go. And we launched it. And then what happened was we sold product that we, and it hadn't even been made yet. And so it was the first night, the first time I, got, I went to bed and woke up in the morning and had made money, right? It was like this really cool experience. And then we sold out of all of that product before it had even been made. So when the factory came back from Chinese New Year, we said, all the product that you're making for us, can you, we need twice as much. And so then we started doing pre-sales. And so we would, uh, uh, and, and, the comp and the product would sell out very, very quickly. So it became this sense, it created the situation of like urgency to buy the product for our customer base before it was gone. And we weren't doing that as a way to just, we weren't trying to create demand. We are just making as much product as we could. And so when we realized the excitement around it, like the very first floral launch that we had, products sold out, and then it was four months before we could bring back any of the floral. Um, and people were asking for it every single day, every single day. Similar thing on that first Black Friday, we made all black trainers uh, that sold out rapidly. And then we had a really difficult decision to make. Do we make them, do we uh, make more right away or do we wait? And so we waited until Black Friday of 2016. Um, and every single day people were asking us for the all black trainer. And then when we started to tease it in 2016, there was so much excitement. And we tried to make what we thought was like a month's worth, and, uh, and it sold out within like 24 hours. And then in 2017, the same thing. We, like, we held off, didn't make any more, um, and then we thought we were making a month's worth, and it sold out you know, in a week. And in 2017, we were like, what, like the, the largest short store on Shopify for like the first hour of Black Friday, and like, I think number three in the world on, the, on Black Friday. Um, because of the excitement and anticipation and the urgency, people recognize that if they didn't buy it right away, they may not be able to buy it. Will you please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like, I'd like to thank it. everybody who is uh, missing the soccer match today. Thank you for coming. <laughs> not yes. watching on their phone. <laughs> Got I see you. <laughs> Please join us out um, in the hall for a quick drink uh, and chat with each other. We'll start our next session with Georgia at 4.15. Thanks so much.